Well, good evening and welcome to the latest edition of Homegrown here, uh, presented by EHM and LTV. My name is Harry Waring from 92.9 and 96.9 EHM. And it's a pleasure to welcome to this beautiful studio, Bill O'Connell. How are you? I'm fine, Harry. It's great to be here. It's nice to meet you. Uh, this is something a little bit different because they, they have this beautiful piano that they, they got in the studio. They're doing amazing things here at LTV lately. Right. And it's really nice to have some of your, your caliber come in and chat and play some, some music. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it's okay. You know, uh, I have the connection with Long Island in the East End, and I'm happy to be here to spread the jazz gospel well it's interesting i want to kind of get back and part of homegrown is is learning where people come from and um kind of how they're associated with this end of the island but you actually you're out in montauk right now stan right we've had a house uh my wife and i we bought well uh, well i should start i, I grew up in port washington okay. long island and my mother who is really the driving musical force in my family uh we used to come out on vacations to Montauk, and then I carried that on when I had a family. And, and one time we're out there, and I, this is before the internet, 25 years ago. And I'm looking, I see something in the paper that, hey, maybe we could swing this, you know. And, well, we did. And uh, I'm happy we did. We love Montauk. So we've been out there vacationing, and now it's... Um, going to be a permanent home for us in September. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's great. Nice to have you here full time out here yeah. on, on the East End of Long Island. Curious, so you mentioned your mother and being such a, an influence on your music. You grew up, you were born in Port Washington. When did you first start uh, getting involved in music? It sounds like from a very early age. Well, uh, her brother, uh, Bill Wisniewski, who passed away a few years ago, he was my piano teacher. Oh, wow. he, he got his master's. Uh, from the Manhattan School of Music. So I studied with him as a kid. How old were you when you first? Probably around five. Wow. You know, and then, uh, but the, the but the real story, I mean, he, my uncle was really open to me doing other things besides just classical music when I started to be interested in writing music. He encouraged me. So that was really important. He was a very positive guy. But one thing I really remember is when I was like 10 or 11 you know, I probably wasn't practicing as much as I should have been. I'd rather go out and play baseball, you know, uh, like most kids. And my parents came to me and my mother came to me and she said, you know, you don't have to do this, Bill. You don't have to take piano lessons. And right then, I, I and it, it's emotional for me to talk about it. Then I realized how much it meant to me. I said, no, I, I, I have to do this. That's great. It's almost freedom to be yeah, realized. I mean, to, to really, really do right. enjoy it. And it wasn't, then it, it changed. It, it became something I wanted to do as opposed to something that they would run around and you got to practice, 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 you know. Now, your uncle sounds like an amazing accomplished musician and he was, he was right. teaching you. But were your parents, did they play as well? Um, my mother sang. She, you know, and my grandfather was a New York City cop, but he, uh, they would all, Sundays, we'd, they'd all sit around the piano and then, and, you know, sing all these, uh, you know, Sweet Georgia Brown and uh, various old songs that I, I had no, I, I didn't know at the time. Um, so it was, music was happening all the time. My father, he could play like Matilda on the guitar. That was about it. But, <laughs> but he was encouraging. So I, you know. So you he, really, let, he let me go down this crazy path, so I appreciate him for that. So around 10, 11, you realized, wow, I, I really do want to play the piano. What music were you listening to? I'm curious, overall, that kind of influence. Oh, I, was, I was like how you wanted regular to. kind of, you know, I mean, in, in, the, in my teens, it was, you know, rock and roll and the Grateful Dead and actually Frank Zappa, the Mothers right. of Invention. That was kind of a bridge group to me to get into the jazz stuff. Uh, but... You know, and then I was into, into modern classical music, too, Verez and, you know, Stravinsky and other more obscure people, too. Just I was just searching mm -hmm. for sounds like I wrote a piece for my high school orchestra. I just, you know, <laughs> trying was, to find myself. Did you find yourself becoming obsessed with practicing and just writing at that, that early yeah. age? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, music took over for me. At one point it was maybe sports a little bit, yeah. but then gradually we transitioned to like, you know, three or four hours of music. I was just consumed by it, you know? Did you pretty much know then that you, you wanted to go to school to study for it as well? 
Yeah. I knew that. That was the only thing that I really had <laughs> that kind of passion for. What's it like? Yeah, obviously, um, you went to Oberlin, which right. is, is world renowned. What's right. it like to go there and kind of really start to build who you are as a musician, I'd imagine? Well, I went there uh, as a uh, composition major. Yeah. But as important as that, the the teachers I've met there, also the students were really important because that's where I really became aware of jazz. Like a, a roommate of mine came to a drummer by the name of Chris Braun, who now lives out in California. He, he Somehow they put us together as college roommates. And he came to school with like every train and miles record, you know, and I was like, I hadn't heard all that stuff. So I, I was like... This kind of took over my musical interests because to me, jazz has the intellectual sophistication as well as the earth, you know, the groove. And that really made me want to play it. It was really college the first time when you really started to think about jazz more as, mm -hmm. as and kind of what attracted you to it. Well, that was it. You know, I was I was always into being intellectually stimulated yeah. by music. But then when I heard jazz i was like oh man this stuff swings too mm -hmm. you know or or latin music how it grooves in was, a that, way. was that the first time you heard miles davis in college or? I, I heard it in high school but yeah, and i heard you didn't listen like, to it i guess you know, I, know well, I listened to it but first time i put uh a love supreme on i didn't know what to do with it i put it away for like six months and then i then i heard it again and i was like oh i didn't understand it but i heard how great it was same thing kind of with Miles. Were you performing a lot in college or just writing, really? Writing, yeah. yeah. I, I've always been a writer first. And then uh, at some point, I said, well, I don't want to just sit up in a room and write. i got to get my chops together, too. Well, before we talk about the performance aspect, I'm curious, how long does it normally take you to write? And, and how, when you, how long does it take you to say it's, it's finished? Or is, it, or is it ever I, finished? I, I'm not sure about that. You know, if it's ever finished, you, you decide it's finished. Yeah. Uh, you know, some writing, sometimes it happens really quick if your idea is really strong in your mind. Other times it might take years. You know, I might have a first part of a song and then not really know how to resolve it or develop it until 10 years later. So, you know, you can't really tell. But... I like it when it's an organic process, when I'm not really, because I, I believe music is out there for everybody to hear. Yeah. It's just kind of tuning into it. Uh, so when I'm walking down the street and all of a sudden a melody comes to my head or a rhythm or something, or something that I feel like I can develop into a piece of music, that's, uh, that's a cherished moment. I want to get into a little bit more about what kind of your, some of your influences as you were building in your um, your experience in college. Why don't we do a song, though? Actually, we have yeah, this beautiful piano. Sure. Here. Well, I thought I'd start with something that, of course, when I play it, hopefully people will recognize it. <laughs> but uh, I thought I'd play Duke Ellington's Prelude to a Kiss. So let's see. Can I...
Very nice. Thank you for doing this. That, that sounds amazing. We're live here right. for Homegrown and LTV and uh, with Bill O'Connell. Bill, I'm curious. I was, I was thinking about when you first, when you were in school, is there a moment and a time you remember a certain experience? Because you were with such amazing, talented musicians. It's To get them all in a certain area where everyone's learning and growing. Take us back to that time. What was that like for you? And is there anything that really stands <clears throat> out to you when you knew, hey, I really want to continue this with jazz? <clears throat> well... Listen, school can be kind of daunting because you're around all these great people. I mean, you know, I, I unfortunately I don't have perfect pitch, but you know, I can hear what's going on. Uh, but you see people, you know, you're in school and you you, you hear people who you, you know you go, and they can like tell you each note. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, okay, well that's 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 a hell of a trick. But <laughs> you know, what do you do with that? But then again, you kind of, you see that music is not all just that. It's about what's inside you, what you have to express, can you express it, uh, do you have something to say, which I think we all do. It's just a question of tapping into it. So, you know, did, did, I, did I have doubts about it? Of course. I, you know, everybody has uh, wondered, hey, can I, can I really do this? But... Again, you know, it was it was something I felt so much passion for. I didn't know what else I wanted to do. So in a way, I had no choice. Music chose me. Where did you go after college? What kind of... What... Uh, then I came to New York. I studied with a great pianist, a guy named Richie Byrack, uh, who's still around. I think teaching in uh, Germany. And, uh, and then I got into the scene. You know, started meeting people in New York. New York's the greatest place to meet the greatest musicians and uh, started playing with the best people I could. What, uh, what attracted you to the Latin side of it, the Latin side of jazz? Well, there was so much of that going on in the 70s. And, uh, I, you know, some of the people I admired, like Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea, had gone through the Latin thing playing with Mongo Santa Maria. Uh, who and, and others, but I was fortunate enough to play with Mongo for a couple of years. That was my first kind of road gig. Right around the time when I was playing with Chet Baker, too, I had to make a choice. You know, Chet asked me to go to Europe. Mongo had a West Coast tour. And people had told me, be a little careful when you go to Europe with Chet. We don't want to go into all the details about getting paid and everything. But So I, I decided to go with Mongo. And, uh, you know, New York, the Latin scene was just so happening and the, and the music was burning. The people, like, there were Latin clubs, people were dancing and everything. Of course, I didn't grow up with this music, so I got an opportunity to play with a real funky band in Brooklyn. Uh, a trumpet player called and said, hey, the piano player can't make it. Can you come down? And I went down and I, I hung out and uh, I played. I didn't know anything. I, But the bass player taught, taught me how to go... You know, and <laughs> I just did that and hung on for dear life. But then when it came time to solo, that was natural to me. And the cats were like, oh, man, you can, you know, they, they love the way I solo. So they would put up with me while I'd try to hang on to the time. So I really kind of learned a lot by doing and playing in the clubs in New York a little bit before I got the gig with Mongo Santa Maria. And, but I just was at, uh, drawn towards the the rhythmic complexity and the, and the groove, just in the same way that I was drawn towards jazz. How long did it take you to become comfortable? Because it sounds like at first you were just composing kind of by yourself almost. What was it like to learn how to perform? And who what was the bigger who was a big influence in kind of teaching you a little bit of a stage presence and the whole oh presentation? I, I think you just kind of <laughs> you kind of just develop. You know, I remember one of one of my first. You know. In the beginning, you're kind of terrified. Well, because you mentioned a little bit there where you kind of learned a couple of things right. that you knew how to control the crowd. Or... I like I like Victor Lewis's, he, my great colleague at Rutgers. He, he, he sort of says, you know, I mean, he's the greatest drummer in the world. But, you know, at one point, one of his lines is, uh, at one point, we were all chumps. <laughs> I mean, he says it endearingly. But, you know, we all had a lot to learn. And so it's a process. 
So as long as you don't beat yourself up too much during that time in your life, uh, you can be okay, you know, but you got to, you got to be open to learning. You got to be open to saying, Hey, I don't know what's going on yeah. or I, I screwed this up or whatever in order to get to the next place. Um, and certainly in Latin music coming out into my twenties, it's not like I grew up listening to clave or yeah. anything. Uh, I had to kind of give myself to that process. But luckily, I had guys who were really encouraging, you know, uh, in the bands. They, they, they heard something in me and they really encouraged me to go down that path. So I'm uh, I'm indebted to them. When did you start teaching? Because I know that was a bit part of your life as well. Uh, I've I've always been teaching privately, yeah. but I've been teaching at Rutgers uh, University for probably the last 10 to 12 years, you know, teaching piano students. Uh, and also teaching improv and composition and pretty much whatever they need me to teach the, the given year. <laughs> well, I'm sure. Well, I want to chat about that a little bit, but uh, let's go back. So you're basically you're getting kind of your chops with, with Latin music and mm -hmm. learning the, the scene, so to speak, um, and you're out there. When did you decide to become a leader of your own and, and be, kind of take on that role? Well, I think it was almost by necessity. I saw what was happening with the scene. And, you know, I'd played with all these great people, played with Mongo, with Sonny Rollins uh, in the jazz world, Chet and Chet Baker. And then I hooked up with Dave Valentine for many years, who did a lot of, did, did many CDs with him. Uh, and Gato Barbieri, Fort Apache, uh, Jerry Gonzalez and the Fort Apache band. Just played with all these great people. And there was a lot of work as a side man. Then as I got started to get a little older i saw a younger cats maybe starting to fill into that stuff and and i decided it was time it was time for me to bring some of my experience to as a leader you know it was just it was it was just the right time to do that not an easy transition really but i was i, I still do things with other people don't get me wrong yeah. I, i'll always love playing with other people but uh, I just wanted to make that more of a part. So probably around in my 40s, you know, early 40s. But honestly, if opportunities had presented themselves earlier, <laughs> I probably would have done it earlier. Is it something you enjoy, having that responsibility of kind of sure, crafting? Yeah. Sure, because then you have a little more control over the whole sound. It's a vehicle for my writing, uh, although I usually try to sneak my writing into any situation <laughs> I was in. But, uh, yeah, you just have a little more control and, you know, you hire people you really have an affinity for playing. And yeah. Was there something I, that I like. surprised you about it that you learned that you didn't know going into it that you were like, whoa, that, that was not what I expected? Well, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work, uh, not just musically, you know, organizationally speaking. But, <clears throat> but it's worth it. It sounds like it is. Yeah. Are you? How often do you write? I'm, I'm curious. Even now, um, we've had such a strange I'm year. Always, I'm always writing. But imagine it's even in the pandemic year. You yeah. well, that was it. Kind a, of have a chance to sit back. Right. And, it's a. Di it, it was a different year for all of us, and I think it made everyone want to turn inward a little bit. You know, I mean, we had to turn yeah. inward a little bit. We had no choice because there weren't as many gigs. There weren't any gigs. Um. So in that sense, it was sort of a positive, you know, to to look inside yourself even a little more. But as a writer, I mean, I've been writing music since I was like, you know, seven or eight when I looked at a piece of music and I said, well, why did why is that note there? Why is that? Or even in college, uh, I sort of discovered I was a jazz musician because my uh, colleagues who were also trying to become composers I remember having a conversation where they would say, oh, I'm looking for that perfect way to go from here to here. And I would say, well, maybe there are 10 ways to go from here to here <laughs> or 20, you know, like you can, there's not just one way that's going to work, you know, and I think that's a big part of jazz. You know, you, you find you play it one way and you play it the next way and you play it another way differently and everything is you try to approach it in a fresh manner. So, but I'm always writing, always. I know you've got a new project that's coming out in October, right? Tell us a right, little bit about right. how that well, came together. Uh, yeah, this is this is an exciting thing. I record for the High Note Savant label. Uh, the guy who's uh, actually ended up co-producing the record is a drummer named Steve Jordan. 
uh, who I met playing with Sonny Rollins back in the early 80s. And we've been trying to do a record together for 40 years. <laughs> so finally it was like, okay, Steve, I think it's time, man, you know. <laughs> when, did you, when did you start this project? Uh, we recorded a couple of months ago. Okay. Oh, wow, so recently. So it's, okay. it's, uh, it's just about done. I mean, we, the, the playing is done now. Now we're into the production end of it. But, uh, and it was great. Uh, he, he's on it along with some of my buddies who have recorded Lincoln Goings on bass, Craig Handy on saxophone, and Pedrito Martinez is playing some percussion on it. Um, but it was great playing with Steve. Steve's known more in the pop world, playing with, you know, Keith Richard and John Mayer and people like that. Uh, but he's a great jazz drummer, too. People don't know, and hopefully they're going to hear it on this record, you know, how really great and musical he is in, in many settings. He's just a very wide kind of guy. But, you know, I love playing with all those guys. So, uh, so it was fun. So we'll see what happens. That comes out in, in this fall. October, yeah. Very nice. October and you, 2020. And I know you're busy. Yes, hard to believe it's 2021 already. Yeah, right. Um, we've got Jazz Fest coming up, Hamptons Jazz Fest. Uh, right. And I know That's you're involved in that too. Big deal. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to really try to bring jazz to the Hamptons this year. Uh, it came about uh, a, a friend of mine wanted to put on a couple of concerts. A friend of mine is well off, fairly well off, and he wanted to put some concerts out here, you know, with various bands. And I said, okay, that's good. But then I thought, you know, to set up a nonprofit and everything, he's not looking for any yeah. money or anything out of it. He just wanted to bring music to the people. And uh, I brought the jam session people uh, in, uh, you know, Clays Brondahl and Joel Chris, John Landis, Lou Sherwood, uh, everybody to, to get, because uh, they know what they're doing here. They know they've been trying to do this for years. So um, so we're doing it. We're bringing, we're presenting a lot of free concerts, bringing great. great people out here. I'll be leading a band on July 31st at uh, the uh, Southampton Arts Center with Paquito de Rivera as my guest. And also doing something at Gospin Stock on August 15th with hopefully the great Billy Hart on drums. And, uh, and there, but there are other things. Robbie Coltrane is scheduled to come out, Trio de Paz, Donald Harrison, and our, our, our guest here for later, Randy Brecker, is going to be involved. And uh, so, so, really, it's, it's a tremendous thing. And it's all free. It's amazing. Wow. I mean, free for, to the public. I can't think of many free festivals. You know, <laughs> maybe the Detroit Jazz Festival was free, you know, they, where they just. So we're really, and everybody's volunteering. So I hope, uh, I hope it, this is the first year I really hope we can, we can keep it going out here. Well, it's, like, it's very exciting to see it put together. It's not easy to do and, and put together a jazz festival, any festival. Not, really, so. it, it isn't easy. But the unique thing about this festival is it's not just a couple of days. This is kind of like a jazz summer, <laughs> you know, which is kind of, I don't know of any <laughs> other festival that kind of approaches life that way. Uh, so I think that's great. You know, all you got to look in the papers or look and see what's happening. Hopefully we'll have a fairly good PR department, uh, uh, or whoever is doing that, probably a PR department of one, but somebody will be getting it out there so everybody can see what's going on. Uh, throughout the summer you know very exciting why don't we do uh, another song and kind of get a sneak peek of what's coming up okay uh yeah let me do something from a, a record a recording called jazz latin this is called quicksand Thank you. 
Very nice. Bill, thank you for doing it. Homegrown here on LTV as we chat. There's a lot coming up with uh, Hamptons Jazz Fest in at the end of actually August um, is uh, actually just a few weeks away now. Well, the, the Hamptons July. Jazz Fest, yeah, it's July and August. We'll, we'll be in full swing soon. Randy Brecker's going to join us in just a little bit. We'll chat with him. I was just thinking as you were playing, um, you've worked with so many different musicians and it's a, a great community. I'm curious, though, was there a musician that you work with you were kind of surprised because you heard some things maybe they'd be difficult to deal with or that you were kind of really pleasantly surprised that sticks out to you over the years? Well, and I can't think of one, but I will say this. I am I'm eternally grateful to some of the musicians. Well, really to, to many of the musicians I've worked with. You know, uh, I've been blessed to be able to work with like a Mongo Santa Maria or a Sonny Rollins or Chet Baker or even or Jerry Gonzalez and the Ford Apache and all the... Uh, Great uh, John Lucien, a great singer, people may not know about. Uh, you know, so I, I think when you when you hear me, you hear a combination of all of that stuff, as well as my family. You know, like you hear you hear my mom; she's she's coming out That's in that great, too. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> so, it's all like a all combination of all your experiences. But I. I uh, I'm, I really feel lucky to have had uh, the life and music that I've had. What's great, too, is that you are teaching, um, and you've done this, like you mentioned earlier, um, for over 10 years at Rutgers. What's it like working with um, all the experience you've gained and those th things that have made you? What's it like to kind of try to transfer that to these students? It's fun. It's fun. When you get uh, students who are really receptive to what you have to offer, it's great. Uh, I've had some really advanced students. I've had some students that I've had to bring along a little farther from from not such an advanced place. But there's a challenge to all that. I don't. I, I'd never put any limits on anyone, anybody. You know, because because I know from firsthand experience. Excuse me. That you can uh, you can be at one place at one point in your life, but if you really work your tail off. Uh, you can be in another place in five years. Uh, so it's it's fun. It's fun, you know, because you're dealing most of the time with people who have made the similar choices. They're really passionate about music, and they really want to learn. So, okay, I'm ready. I, I You know, I, I love talking about music. That's my life. So if somebody wants to hear about it, and I'll, I'm happy to twist up their brains a little bit and show them my point of view. What have you learned from them as students? Because they're coming from a different time, different <laughs> generation, and different different experiences. Well, themselves. they're technically much more advanced. Like uh, <laughs> you know, we talk about the COVID experience. Uh, we were all teaching online uh, last last year, and uh, like. They like, for example, I, I run the Afro Caribbean Ensemble out of Rutgers. Now, how do you teach an ensemble online? I mean, the basic thing is you're playing. That you, it's a playing situation. You play together and blah blah blah. But we turned it into a, a a recording ensemble, and one of the students coordinated that, and they had all the technical stuff. Everybody would play their parts in, and I'd hear I'd give them arrangements to play, and we'd put it together that way. But to technically put that together for those guys, it was no big deal. They just picked it right up, fell right into it. For me, it was, uh, let's just say I'm glad I had them as my assistant on that level. <laughs> well, congratulations. You made it through the pandemic. And I'm sure made it through and, and a surprisingly lot. a positive experience, yeah. I think, for the students. And, uh, you know, we learned something as teachers. We learned, you know, the Zoom world and how we can communicate that way and, and keep things going. Of course, there ain't nothing like the real thing. And I think in September, we, we will be back to that. Very good. Randy Brecker is going to join us in just a few minutes. We'll chat with him and to talk more about Hamptons Jazz Fest as well. Bill, thank you so much for your time. This is great. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Bill, what's it like to kind of craft this thing for the first time? I was reading that it was, it's been 20 years since the Montauk Jazz Festival. Um, what's it like to kind of, because this is the first year, what, what thought process goes behind <sighs> putting, putting all the artists together? And, of course, Randy is right here to help. Well, Randy's here, and that's uh, that's a beautiful thing for the Hamptons that we've all enjoyed having him out here for a long time. But uh, it's fun. We want to present. Really, we just want to present some great music, whether it's 
focuses on the Latin jazz side, the straight ahead, or maybe even a little bit on the world music side. Uh, we just want to present some of the best music from people uh, in New York and maybe slightly beyond, and some of the best players out here too. Uh, it's very important for me that the local musicians are represented as well as uh, some of the great people that we've known and loved to uh, base themselves out of New York City. I think this uh, this festival really comes at a good time because I, I musicians really just need to get, and get out there and it's everyone's kind of been locked up for so long. Um, perfect time to put this whole thing together and get out there back on the stage. Definitely a lot of pent up uh, playing energy <laughs> from everybody. Uh, Randy, do you uh, agree with that? Oh, I wholeheartedly uh, concur. You know, uh, we've all been uh, uh, kind of cooped up in our houses and trying to keep my t our chops up and try to be creative and keep that air of spontaneity that we all need in our brain to play. So it's uh, it's been quite a challenge. And it's great that it looks like we're finally getting back out there. So the timing of this uh, Hampton Jazz Festival is just perfect. Um, you mentioned something there. What's it like to keep, I, I guess, keep in shape to be able to, because everyone kind of had a year off. Um, you really have to force yourself to, to practice and to, to continue to play, I'd imagine. Well, if you want to keep playing, yeah, uh, you have to practice. There's no way around it. And uh, especially when you're not doing gigs, it builds up playing on a gig with the pressure and the audience and the give and take. It's another kind of thing. Uh, uh, trumpet, uh, any instrument, but particularly brass instruments or what I play, uh, you have to hit it every day. There's just no other way. And uh, I'm always... Uh, 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 think about this interview with a great trumpeter from my hometown or lived in my hometown clifford brown uh, i read an interview right when pandemic started i was going through old magazines and the and the interviewer was saying how well you sounded clifford on a gig first <laughs> night of the gig in new york and clifford had explained well we've been off for two weeks and of course during my off period I practice, but when you get back to a gig, it always takes you two or three days to kind of plant your foot and get your footing back. And that was only two weeks, and we've been off for a year and a half. So if that's any uh, 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 way to kind of picture what we've been through, that's a, a good uh, way to kind of explain it. How did you spend your time over the past uh, year and a half but being locked up and locked down in these Well, we've done some home recording. Luckily, we're for various people that ask via file sharing, kind of like Bill, oh, Bill yeah. was explaining. I, I record in our basement. My wife's a fine engineer and saxophonist, and she records, and we managed to put things together for people. So that was uh, part of it. And I did two live gigs in the year and a half, about six months apart. Uh, one was in Aspen and one was in Cincinnati recently with the slowly things reopening. But imagine that, two live gigs in <laughs> something like 16 months. And the rest is just, I've been in my basement and I kind of scour the internet for things I could play along with, kind of live Sonny Rollins somewhere as it was a good example, or live this guy or that guy, tr Coltrane live somewhere and just... You know, put on headphones, put on the MP3, and play along. That's what I've been doing every night. Every kind of turn down the lights and pretend I'm at a gig. <laughs> well, I was curious when you did those two gigs, was it different? Because I feel like audiences kind of oh, are learning how to react now too. Well, it's quite different, and it was a kind of a lot of uh, 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 the word is fear. I guess <laughs> you know, you're just out of practice playing in front of people and being out front where you know. It's hit or miss. So, uh, but it was great at the same time. You know, once I got to relax after two or three tunes and got used to it, even though the audience in both places were uh, minimal, was only 25% capacity, just playing in front of people and getting the feedback, which is what we all need. And that's what really makes the spontaneity fun, was, is get, it's a two-way street with the audience. And that part of it was just great. What new projects were uh, kind of born over the past year for you? Well, I had a lot of stuff out last year that I was, uh, in fact, we finished one in the middle of uh, pandemic, which was totally <laughs> file shared with a great saxophonist, Eric Marienthal. I guess that was the last thing that came out in the middle of thing. It's a uh, record called Double Dealing with uh, George Witte, who produced it, an old friend of mine and uh, 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 
Dave Weckel and John Patitucci on a few tracks. So that kept us busy for the first three or four months. They eventually kind of came out. They're kind of maybe put it out again. Uh, you know, it's a lot of the record companies was pretty confusing to all of us. So I think there's going to be a plethora of just a rush to get everything. Like in the film business, the yeah. same thing they d it would happen there. So that was one of the last projects, plus a project with my wife, Brecker Plays Rovati, <laughs> we did. And uh, we we're hoping for the best. One day at a time, one week at a time, things seem to kind of change from day to day, week to week. But we're very excited about the festival out here. I, I couldn't be more excited to be a part of it. Let's do a, let's do a song, if you okay. guys want to. Yeah. Well... We chose we a like song that I like to play and Bill likes to play, and uh, hopefully we're in the same key. Cause, yep, uh, it is. I'm looking at the music because uh, I actually got this tune up last night, and I realized a lot of people do it, including Coltrane did it in another key. So we're doing this in the key of E flat. Very okay. nice. My Shining Hour, it's called. So where, where you want to play it? Okay, that's about that. I guess let's just do right on a swinging because that'll probably be best. <laughs> Thank you. 
Very nice. Bill O'Connell and uh, Randy Bracker here, the LTV Studios for Homegrown, as we're getting ready for Hamptons Jazz Fest coming your way in July and August in and just a couple weeks. Some of September. Yes, it, it continues and it's free. That's the great part about this. And I, what, I mean, one of the things I was thinking watching you guys play, you're both, if I'm not mistaken, teachers uh, in a way. Randy, I know you've done a lot of workshops over the years yep. um, with the Brecker brothers and you know, all of that. What's it like to kind of be in this this portion of your career and obviously you're still teaching um what's one of the things that you guys want to get out there to these students to kind of impart to them what you've learned and especially as times have changed so much and genres have kind of come together what's one of the things that sticks out in your mind when you work with new students of today well that's a, a all-encompassing question but the the short answer is and i know this is true for any musician Music is life. Yeah. It's everything evol uh, uh, revolves around that. Everything. So, and we're all we're all students. We're all learning as we go. This has been great for me the year and a half because I think I learned more about various styles of music and just things that I could study and see. Uh, that part of it was fabulous to be home and have time to do that. Plus, being with a family. But uh, and. You know, it's a button away to happiness. Uh, we're so thankful that we love music, and it's such an important part of our lives. It's as simple as that. It, yeah, I would add, yeah. uh, you know, just being open, open to, and that, and that brings it back to the life aspect, too, being open to let your life influence your music, being open to whatever may happen out there, because there's a lot of music left out there to be discovered, you know, for all of us. Not to put you on the spot, are there any new musicians out there that you've kind of recognized and want to that come to mind right now as far as to look out for the check? Well, out? there's a there's a multitudes of young players, but uh, I guess I hearken back to Jacob Collier, who really uh, set the world afire with his uh, compositional vocal uh, videography techniques and his various theories. And I'm only comprehending the little tip of the iceberg. So he yeah, always right. comes to mind. It's yeah. interesting, too, because kids are learning how to play so <laughs> so differently, too. They're learning from YouTube videos and learning from um, people like you that post uh, you know, certain things. What's that like to, to know it's so different from when you grew up? Well, a lot of it is the technology, so that's a whole other aspect to yeah. it that you have to kind of inch your way into and, and through. I'm lucky that my wife is more what do I say, technologically curious than I am, but it forces me to kind of challenge myself and get on a keyboard and get on a computer and try to figure a way, not only through uh, the musical part, but now, as you mentioned, video is such a, an important part of the whole thing. You can't not uh, address it. Well, we can't wait to Hamptons Jazz Fest, like I said, uh, July, August, and September. Uh, when are you playing uh, for it? Well, I'm playing as a secret special guest, but <laughs> let me mention this. It's uh, that, no. it's uh, Thursday night at uh, the uh, new Art Center Church in uh, Sag Harbor. And then I'm playing I th man, in September, I, I think it's the 24th at the Whalers Church with my, with my friend Bill here <laughs> and right. my uh, more regular group. So we'll be doing a lot of... Uh, original material of mine and uh, and Bill's and my wife's. Uh, the upcoming Thursdays with uh, Clace and John Hart, a wonderful guitarist who uh, was in New York for many years and teaches at the University of Miami now. And uh, Santi DiBriano on bass, who's a wonderful New York bassist. And we're going to kind of be jamming and plus playing a couple tunes of our own, I think. So that'll be great. And there'll probably be some other things to come up. It's kind of day by day. Take it one day at a time for Hamptons Jazz Fest over the next few weeks and months. And uh, thank you for doing this, Bill. Congratulations on putting it together, being the artistic director for it. And uh, thank, thank you for you, playing Harry. for us. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. It's very exciting. Just as you said, the musicians have a lot of, uh, we really want to get out there, I hope. And I think the audience is just as uh, yeah anxious to get out there and hear some great music so we look forward to seeing everybody out there this summer well we can't wait for this year and years to come as it as it grows so we congratulations hope. on yeah. it thank you so much for joining us uh, bill and randy for homegrown here on ltv thank you thank you